All right, beautiful. All right, so I have to say that this is a bit surreal uh, being up here since I was a graduate student at the last Protostars and Planets in Heidelberg. And so I'm delighted to be able to share with you the chapter uh, written here with Anna Miatello, Inga Kamp, Till Bernstiel, myself, and Akimasa Katooka. Uh, we uh, actually, four of us are present, uh, so you're welcome to come and ask questions afterwards. Um, but I want to start by motivating why we wrote this chapter a bit by emphasizing that we are truly in the decade of data. We have beautiful data uh, that we've seen in previous talks and we're gonna see in, a, in upcoming talks on source specific studies where we can res really resolve the fine details. And we're also in the decade where we can now start to statistically sample disks, populations of disks, hundreds of disks and learn a lot about them as uh, a larger sample. And so this has enabled us to start learning more about what the big picture questions are. What, is, what do disks look like at their largest scale? Not at resolving the fine innermost details, but what can we learn about what the typical conditions of planet formation look like? Now, this decade of data has been met with, as you could see in the previous, uh, previous talks, uh, by a true you know, theoretical renaissance to, to match. So for each of these puzzling observations of disk interesting exotic disk structures or parameters, uh, both actually physical and chemical features, theorists have come up with very creative uh, explanations to understand what we are actually looking at. And so these creative you know, interpretations often can ex explain quite well and match data uh, to sometimes very complex and often sometimes perplexing, uh, very perplexing phenomena. So this you know, theorist playground uh, is great, uh, but we wanna step back with this chapter and figure out what we have actually learned. What is the big picture? So with these huge advances both on the data as well as the uh, theoretical uh, uh, models, what have we actually learned about planet formation more generally? Um, can we apply what we've learned from the very detailed source-specific studies where we've had to match really complicated, complex observations, often multi-line, multi-feature, uh, to actually start to move towards a big picture, towards our understanding of disks as a, a population? Are there commonalities? Uh, and, and disk fundamental properties? Can we say something about big picture questions like whether planet formation is efficient or not? Or what makes a disk very good at forming planets or not? And what do we actually need to start putting our solar system into context? Are we an outlier or are we somewhere you know, in the middle? Okay, so, but before getting into it, I wanna also step back and ask, you know, what, what do we mean by fundamental? I actually started by asking my colleagues who don't work on star or planet formation to ask, I asked them what we should be working on as a, as a community here, and they all said to me, where are the aliens? That was like the most interesting thing to them. Uh, we can't really answer that yet. Maybe that's protostars and planets 100, who knows? But uh, not yet. But for us, what fundamental means uh, are, are sort of, are listed here, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means. So, we want to understand things as a community. We want to understand things like, what is the planet formation efficiency? Given a mass of, of disk, uh, initial mass of a disk, or maybe integrated mass of a disk over time, as it may still be fed, how, what do we expect the efficiency factor in conversion into planets to look like? Is it like stars, where it's something like 1%? You know, is it greater, is it better? We want to know where the matter is. Do we expect uh, a lot of mass of, at f large orbits? Do we expect the formation of sort of wide uh, orbit giant planets to be efficient or not? We also want to understand uh, what do the planets, as they emerge out of the disks, what are their typical compositions, both the solid phase and the icy phase, and also what the, their gaseous envelopes might look like. We want to answer questions of time scales. Do planet, planets form very, very early on? Um, how, well, stepping back even a step, when do grains grow? The first step to forming planets, you have to start to grow your grains, we think. So how quickly do the dust grains grow and the planets form? How do we measure that? And we wanna know uh, how, what is the, the vertical, dis, ver, the disk, eh, radial distribution and the vertical distribution, and how does that affect the composition of planet forming disks and the way in which, you know, this disk could intercept radiation, could change your picture entirely. So our chapter took these questions on. 
Uh, and and we, asked, we, we, we were looking at this and we realized, well, these, all of these questions are really important. We all want to know the answers to those questions, but they're all incredibly hard to measure, even for a single source. Much less, it, much, even, even harder for a very large sample where you need lots and lots of data. So all these fundamental properties are really hard to directly measure. And so what our chapter aimed to do was to review what we've been doing over the last decade with this beautiful data. What, have the, what does the modern uh, method development uh, look like to measure fundamental properties like disk mass, disk size, et cetera, uh, using this beautiful data? And the data truly are beautiful. So these are some of the figures from our chapter over here. You're seeing you know, scattered light from the surface of a disk uh, compared to the ALMA compact, it's sort of hard to see here on the projector, but the compact uh, millimeter emission. Here's an edge on disk. You see the beautiful scattered surface with the pancake thin millimeter layer. So we wanted to review these, the methods in which we can use this information to start to learn what do disks look like in the big, in, in the aggregate. And also we wanted to examine what our limitations of method, our current methods are and what does our field need to solve before the next protostars and planets. Maybe not 100, but maybe, you know, at least eight, perhaps. Where we can start to connect the things where we know a lot about the details and we can study these to death and apply it to these, these disks over here where we don't know a whole lot about them individually, but we have a whole, lot of, a, a, lot, a whole lot of them where we can start to average over some of the uncertainties or peculiarities. All right, so the topics of our chapter, the, the, the properties we focused our effort on, um, are listed here, but I should actually probably list them like this based on how I'm gonna spend the time. So first I'm gonna spend most of the time on discussing disk mass and its distribution, so sigma. Uh, I'll talk about how we measure disk radial size, both in the gas and the dust. How we, uh, I'll briefly touch on uh, the temperature structure as well as the vertical structure of disks, and we have a few case studies sort of embedded in here on grain growth, uh, how we estimate disk mass and the parameters it depends on, uh, and relationships with turbulence. All right, so first, disk mass. All right, so the motivation, why we wanna know things about this, this, this may be arguably the most fundamental property of disks that is probably one of the hardest to understand, is so we wanna know what, what is the total budget of planet, planetary material that could turn into planets? What is our, what's the possibility um, that a disk you know, could form um, giant planets? So or is gas giant planet formation common? Is there enough mass around to even do that? Um, how much dust mass is there? Uh, can we all start to infer the dust, uh, the amount of solid mass that's in larger bodies that are observably uh, difficult. And also how much remains after planet formation is done? And how much of that is lost in various processes that are not related to planets? That gets into that efficiency question. Also, if you care more about the composition of disks and how that gets incorporated into the chemical um, structure of planets, uh, you'd also want to know uh, something about the H2 mass to actually measure an accurate chemical abundance because we normalize every molecular uh, measurement to total disk, you know, total disk mass or if it's a column density, you know, to the local column density. But you need to know something about that really important denominator to start to actually put this sort of information into models of, plan of planetary structure, right? So the next talk is going to go into this in detail. Uh, so it, it, the last decade has, we've just, the, the, the number, the population, the, the numbers of measurements that have been made to survey disks have, are astounding. But most of this work has been done on the dust. The dust is much easier to directly observe. You get to average over your huge frequency domain. Uh, and so from this, you know, you can start to build up statistics. Uh, and so to take this, these observations and convert them into a number, at least a number that is interesting for uh, forming future planets, this classical relationship is typically assumed where you have something about uh, the emission at a certain temperature of your black body type dust, your opacity, uh, and uh, the, the total, uh, the, the, the mass that you're going after here. So the, the observational quantities over here on the flux side. Now, if you take that uh, relationship here at face value, an un uncomfortable fact immediately appears. So this is a, a nice work by uh, Heiss Mulders where uh, he took the total amount of dust from the observed Alma class two disks and he compared it to the known, uh, uh, or the, the inferred solid mass locked up in the observed Kepler planets. And 
the fact, well, you don't have to understand necessarily this plot in detail. It's a distribution of disk masses in solids here on the bottom. The fact that these curves all overlap on one another is a little uncomfortable. Because what it means, what it implies, is that we need all the dust we observe, these small dust, millimeter or centimeter or smaller, available to make the planets we see. We know that nothing, absolutely nothing in nature is 100% efficient. <laughs> At least we think so. <laughs> so the, that, th this, that this implies that would be rather uncomfortable to all of us. Uh, so the underlying, what was, what's used to derive this mass distribution is this equation um, down here. All right, so let's unpack it. Let's see what, what are the methods or the, the assumptions underlying this particular method of taking flux and trying to get dust, disk, dust, disk, ma disk, dust mass. Ah. So uh, you have to assume something about the temperature of your dust grains. You have to assume something about what your dust grains are made of and that's locked up in your uh, kappa. You have to, you're assuming, by using this equation, you're assuming you're in the optically thin regime, which, you know, pre-ALMA, we were feeling pretty good about. This also assumes you're in the Rayleigh genes regime, uh, uh, where you know you're you're on the long wavelength tail, which, when, as we go to shorter and shorter wavelengths of ulma, doesn't we find you know isn't really a safe assumption. Okay, so if we take those terms and and open them up a little bit and unpack them, what you find pretty quickly by just looking, and this has been known for quite a long time, uh, that if you just change or tweak what you assume about your dust grains, the composition of your grains, the size distribution, the porosity, the filling factor, the numbers change quite wildly just for this one part of this equation. So just as a couple of examples here from our chapter, so in the case of uh, the green versus this pinkish color here, the only change is that the, the, a different type of carbonaceous grain was assumed. And so you get almost an order of magnitude change in that, that parameter. You can change your porosity, for example. So having a 90% porous grain versus a 10% porous grain, and that can change uh, also the, the kappa, but as well uh, it can change sort of the opacity spectral index. This is the thing that we want to measure often uh, through looking at the flux spectral index. We think it's related to the flux spectral index alpha is related to the opacity spectral index beta through this relationship here. Again, that relies on some assumptions, optical depth being then and Raleigh genes approximation. So basically what this means is that kappa, this value here, it strongly varies with all your d assumptions about your dust microphysics. And so what do we know observationally about dust microphysics? So a ton of work has been done here. Uh, and so from this, you know, if you take just the dust thermal emission and you compare your, uh, spectral, your flux spectral index, in this case for uh, one and three millimeter emission, the photometry of disks show that on, on disk average scales, that the SEDs, the, the spectral index on the flux, is relatively low. This is telling you something. It tells you immediately that dust is not interstellar. Interstellar dust grains would be up here. So we know dust growth has happened in these disks. That at least is extremely clear from, our, from the data. You notice that actually you're getting down here into the large dust regime, but some of the data is starting to push down here to even sub to alpha values. And so for a while it was, there was some thought, oh, okay, maybe some measurement uncertainty. We shouldn't get down here, that, that's uncomfortable. But now we know with these beautiful resolved observations with ALMA that dust is actually pretty optically thick. And at that point, you, can't, you can no longer neglect the scattering component of your dust, uh, of your dust radiative transfer. Thermal emission isn't the only window we have into understanding what dust looks like or what dust is made of. Uh, polarization also uh, can tell us, uh, tell us a lot about what our dust grains are doing. And polarization, in fact, does tell us something different, tells us a different story. So the submillimeter wave polarization maps over here, they're all ALMA, so they're all post protostars and planet six. And they're beautiful. You have a whole gallery of really interesting and different varied morphologies. And you've seen polarization vectors in the previous talks. Those have been largely, we've been talking more about magnetic fields. For disks, the disks are so dense and optically thick that we think that these polarization patterns, based on their morphology and how they change uh, spectrally, the, what we're seeing here are actually r the result of self-scattering effects, uh, dust alignment effects, and so forth. But if you take uh, these observations at face value, 
what they what what tends to what uh, these observations tend to point to is not millimeter sized dust grains, but rather hundred micron sized dust grains, ten times smaller. So is there tension here? What do we actually know even about the growth, the first step in forming a planet, i.e. dust growth, right? Well, luckily, this renaissance, this, this era of, of wonderful data has um, actually given us a clue. So if you observe, this is the T TW Hydra inner disk. Uh, given the, high, the beautiful uh, high uh, sensitivity data, you can start to see that these disks, this inner disk is not consistent actually with the black body, and it's slightly depressed down here. Uh, below the black body curve. And so that's telling you something. That's telling you the disk is fainter than it should otherwise appear if it were black body radiation. And that is actually pointing to the role of dust scattering. So essentially dust scattering here, the importance of scattering was sort of, sort of rediscovered in the process of getting better and better data. And this naturally makes the continuum fainter and explains those low spectral indices. And if you take that into account and you model your uh, ALMA observations, you get, okay, the dust might be a few hundred microns in size, and the tension is not so bad. But regardless, we see growth of dust. So uh, what about the next parameter here? Uh, the, the in, w underlying this parameter, uh, we assume that the dust is optically thin. Well, again, all the observations, especially resolved ones, have shown that the dust optical depth as a function of radius, well, pre-ALMA days, we were in a, within a beam, you'd have a bunch of em apparently empty gaps along with substructures, and so you're kind of mixing up bright and faint things, and so it looked, on the whole, optically thin. But once you started resolving it, you, s you see that actually everything is rings a lot, in the most, for the most part, rings and gaps. And especially in those rings, uh, in those, yeah, in the bright features, in the rings, you're approaching optical depths of definitely greater than, than 0.1, but approaching one or in some cases higher. And this is even at large radii, in some cases, you know, out to 100, 100 AU. So the assumption of optically thin, you know, we can't quite make anymore. And this is, you know, especially the case, as I said, in resolved structure. But all of that taken into account, with all of those uncertainties, there's still a, a pretty amazing uh, feature in that if you compare all of these class two disks to the class, to the younger uh, disks over here, class one or younger sources, there is still a big shift in the total mass distribution. So if this is time, there is something happening to the dust. And this is not something that can be attributed purely or swept under the rug with opacity uncertainties, temperature uncertainties, dust properties. This difference is real as it go from younger to older, older disks. So what's going on? Well, there's plenty of speculation. You can say, well, all the planet formation happened early, and so all of this loss process has gone into planets. Okay, well, then where are all the planets? That would be 10, 10 Earth mass cores. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of planets hanging around. Um, has dust grown just into slightly larger boulders that are still unobservable? Maybe dust has drifted radially inwards uh, and possibly even been accreted onto the central star. Or has dust you know, been concentrated just into very optically thick substructures? Lots, lots, of good, lots of good options. And we could just stop there and say we're done, but I would say you know, we should still continue to do, to, to do better. Planet formation is likely continuous. We don't, even if it begins early, it's gonna continue. So we wanna still understand better how much dust mass there really is in the class two phase to know how much planetary potential there is in these later stages. There's lots of planets worth of mass hiding in those very uncertain assumptions. Can we get a better you know, relationship between the, disc, the thin, optically thin case and, and sort of a total, uh, or at least total observable dust mass? Some things will still remain unseen. But can we, can we create some kind of relationship, some correction factor? All right, so moving on to gas mass. Uh, so the dominant, as, as Andrea beautifully showed uh, yesterday, the, most of the mass in these systems is entirely invisible to us, sadly. Uh, so we can't see H2. So we often have to rely on tracers. So most of the disk gas masses out there are relying on things like carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is uh, a good option. It's readily observable. It's readily surveyable, as have been now uh, many cases, uh, or many examples of surveys out in the literature. You'll hear about more in the next talk. And actually, this will become even more uh, routine with the upcoming ALMA Band 6 upgrade. Uh, however, there's really clear issues uh, that have been identified. So if you look at the distribution of gas masses that, are, that come out of carbon monoxide estimates, they are always low. In fact, they're so low, 
we shouldn't even really form very many Jupiter mass type planets. And, and maybe that's okay, but that's something that the data would be telling us. If we have to move to something else, uh, one of the, the, the next best possible gas mass tracers that is observationally, at least presently, unavailable, but maybe in the future, it's HD. So HD, I had to make it spin. You know, we're all kind of sleepy early in the morning. Uh, so HD, HD is maybe, um, it's, it's if you take molecular hydrogen and you now uh, give it a dipole and make it H, uh, H, uh, hydrogen deuteride, now you have a direct, or a, a better tracer, a less indirect tracer of molecular gas. And from the disks where we have, the handful of disks where we have HD detections, CO does seem to be missing at a pretty substantial level. We're talking something like one to two orders of magnitude. But it's only, again, three sources. So this is a wonderful option, but we just, we need to do work as a community to get more data on this particular line. We need new uh, inf far infrared stratospheric or space-based missions to get more sources, to, to understand this really fundamental problem. We have some clues about what's going on. So from our chapter here, we uh, plotted the CO-based gas to dust ratio. So this is total amount of gas mass coming from CO over normalized to the total amount of dust mass. So correcting for the fact that the Herbigs are larger. And so if you plot them here, you see that the Herbigs on the whole seem to have higher CO gas to dust, ah, CO gas to dust ratios compared to the T-Tories. So it seems like there is some kind of temperature effect acting on whatever is happening to CO in these older disks. So can we calibrate this? There's lots of other alternative mass tracers in the literature. I don't have time to go through them all. Um, we have, there's beautiful like, efforts to try and constrain critical densities. Uh, there's attempts to try and use multiple different molecules to correct for CO. There's still a lot of work to be done here. Um, harnessing drift physics, so how, how much gas mass there is that the uh, dust grains have to uh, evolve or transport through. Uh, but depending on what you use, you get a substantial amount of variation. So here we collected all of the, the disk mass estimates for one disk. This is all just TW Hydra, the best studied disk we have. And so you see here that there, the range of total disk masses is, is, is substantial, many orders of magnitude, depending on the method you use. But on the plus side, if we were able to get more HD, we could narrow that uncertainty down more to something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, solar masses, and that's within a factor of three, which can be improved if we learn something more about the disk temperature structure. So basically, our, our disk dust mass is actually uncomfortably low. If optical depth is the reason, uh, there is, we need to find a way to correct for it. Uh, and so this is either we need to get observations at longer wavelengths, or we need method development to sort of find a way to correct for uh, these, these effects. If, it, if the reason is early dust growth or, or the formation of early planets, should we see lots and lots of those, those 10 Earth mass cores sitting around? Where are they? Can we, can we make more testable predictions for how to find these? And on the, on the gas side, we need uh, to either calibrate our existing gas mass tracers better, or we need a new telescope, essentially. We need HD observations. Okay, so moving on, uh, this will be a little bit shorter. Uh, disk mass distribution, so how is it spread uh, with distance from the star, and how can we measure the disk radius? All right, so first, why we'd want to do this? Well, we want to understand what you know, total mass distribution there is available to go into forming planets. We also want to understand you know, how disk gas and dust evolves in time, and to elaborate that a bit, on that a bit more. Uh, so uh, in terms of the different disk dispersal mechanisms, as we heard you know, some of, about this in the last talk, uh, one of the, the features of the different uh, dispersal mechanisms that are on the table are that if we are forming our, 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 if our disks are evolving in a viscous way, we expect them to spread in time. If they're evolving uh, or shedding their angular momentum via winds, they should become more compact. And so we should be able to tell the difference between these evolutionary tracks, perhaps, if we can accurately measure radii in time. The challenge of that is that you need really good data to do it. So this is just a viscous disk. Uh, uh, evolution, so time going from the top to the bottom. So if you, uh, you know, look at this disk, you see how it's the outer radius spreads in time. Okay, great. So if you had really good sensitivity in time, you would see this spread spreading naturally happen. But if you have kind of a, a meh data, lower sensitivity, then you'd actually find the opposite. And even though you'd have a viscous disk, it would actually, you'd, you'd conclude that it was all winds. So you really need to be careful, and you need to be careful in measuring the edge of the disk. And that's in the ideal case, where when we're looking at things like gas surface density, we're always using tracers because we can't see that H2. So we have to use something like CO, and you have all the problems I've already uh, covered. 
And so uh, when you look at the profiles of different disks uh, based on their CO column densities, you see a lot of different morphology. Some of that's actual structure. Some of it is chemistry. And some of it's optical depth. And so those all have to be sort of factored in when you're interpreting this in terms of global disk evolution. When we want to measure disk size, uh, so in the dust, often this is done either with a visibility fitting method or uh, we, if you have sufficient, uh, sufficiently deep data, and you could do it in the image plane. But it's, again, a really strong function of sensitivity. So it's really important that you choose a metric, you measure disk size consistently, and, and know the limitations of the depth of your survey. And you know, as per in the literature, the recommendation is really to choose something like a radius enclosing some, uh, some fraction of the flux. Often choices are something like 68% or 95%, but it really depends on your science case. If you want to learn about disk, disk evolution, you want to get as much flux as you can, but again, be very cautious when you're trying to measure the really true outer edge. All right, so how do they compare? How do the, how do the dust radii and the gas radii stack up? Well, sadly, we don't have a whole lot of examples of extremely deep gas uh, observations because they're so much more expensive than the dust. On the whole, we uh, yes, measure CO, uh, CO radii to be typically, they look, they appear to be typically larger than the dust radii. But this could be, again, an effect of sensitivity, both on the gas and the dust side. It could be chemical. CO could be destroyed from the outside uh, through self-shielding. Or it could be physical. Dust grains could be drifting closer to the star. So before you immediately conclude that physical, uh, the physical uh, explanation that it's all drifting dust grains, it's going to affect, in uh, predictable ways, the shape of the outer continuum edge to be steep steeply truncated. And that's especially true for low turbulence disks. Uh, and so we, we have to, to stop this process. Substructures are invoked um, to stop the radial drift. Uh, but from, if these are present in most disks, they're going to largely be unresolved. So this is something to just keep in mind. All right, so briefly, disk vertical structure, what have we learned about the height or in the vertically, vertical distribution? So modern, the last decade has been wonderful for actually putting together a 2D and even 3D picture of disks. Uh, we've, you know, we can see that these disks are long lived. They're probably in hydrostatic equilibrium-ish, balancing gravity and various pressure forces. And the vertical structure is gonna be related to so many different properties. Temperature structure, turbulence, the presence of winds or not, uh, the chemistry, and, and much more. And so, um, this is a really important parameter to get to, but imaging requires careful interpretation. And so the uh, surfaces, the fact that disks are uh, vertically flared or have vertical structure, that's been known for a while. It's been known since the time of HST. And so uh, the scattered light view has really shown the sort of, uh, by the, the, the two-layered structure where you have the dark midplane in between. So now, this last decade has provided some statistics on these disk structures with VLT and GPI. We can see highly elevated small grains, uh, and in fact, some more spiral structures, as you've seen in previous talks. Even in the same, uh, the same source might have spirals in one wavelength, but not another. So the question, the big questions here, and, and what we want to measure, is how does the scattered light surface compare to the millimeter? Uh, we see that the millimeter emission is typically very pancake thin. And so this is suggestive that the turbulence is weak. You're not stirring up a lot of those millimeter pebbles in the midplane. And the highly elevated small grains, if that turbulence is weak everywhere, which isn't a big if, you know, as we saw in the last talk, uh, how are they staying there? Is it long settling times? Are they lifted by systematic flows? Uh, but essentially, we can't necessarily say that, oh, there's a scattered surface. That means there's definitely turbulence happening. We have to be, you know, be a bit careful. For the gas vertical structure, ALMA has been just truly transformative. This is a cube from the, the MAPS ALMA large program showing HD 163296 vertical structure, where you can see here the beautiful Keplerian pattern of gas simply orbiting the star. And those two layers, the front and the, uh, the, the back and the front layer, are showing you the orientation of the disk. So this front side is brighter because we're seeing the warm, optically thick surface. And so this can be analyzed carefully, and you can measure things like that, the vertical height of the, the gas uh, as a function of position from the star. And you can even do this for multiple isotopologues. And this, was, this is beautiful work by uh, Charles Law showing that here, for multiple sources, you get scale heights, something like z over r of 0.3 to, point, or z over r of 0.3 to 0.5, so scale heights of a few. Uh, and depending on what tracer you use, you get different answers. This could be self-shielding, it could be real, it could be chemical, it could be optical depth, it could be observational bias. You, see, you preferentially see the dense stuff. Uh, so uh, again, you have to be careful in interpreting it. Also, uh, LTE effects are important. 
Uh, on the temperature, uh, temperature is linked to so many different properties, uh, including, but not limited to, uh, disk mass. So how we interpret those HD emission lines, for example, I mentioned earlier, is very temperature sensitive. Uh, how the disk is heated will indirect, uh, directly be affected by how the, the dust is distributed and its optical properties. How does light permeate the disk? Uh, it'll be affected by vertical structure. How does light get intercepted uh, from the star to the disk? Chemistry is going to play a major role on heating and cooling agents. And so to estimate disk temperature across such large scales, it is inherently and inescapably a multi-wavelength endeavor. So inside of 10AU, and, and we have more, so I, I'm sad to have to cut this part short, but uh, just see the chapter for more details on the different tracers. But in general, inside of 10AU, most of our tracers are in the near-infrared or mid-infrared. Uh, and typically, using something like a Boltzmann diagram analysis or slab excitation models, you extract physical information about the inner disk. We're often tracing the surface and not the midplane, except for the, the beautiful example Avin showed yesterday of the silicate-free inner disk. Uh, but you get slightly different answers depending on the molecular tracer, so we might even be seeing chemical structure in the inner disk or temperature gradients there, too. The larger scale radial thermal structure beyond 10 to maybe hundreds of AU often const is constrained with submillimeter tracers. And you can look for uh, chemical shifts, for example, in the midplane to try and get a benchmark spot of what does the temperature look like in your, your particular system. So uh, one that's been used uh, employed many times is looking for uh, rings of N2H plus that trace the disappearance of CO. Other options uh, out there, so for example, you can do multi-line multi analysis again, and so for example, methyl cyanide, uh, CH3CN's K ladder is easily observable in one go, and it's a pretty robust thermometer, and, but it requires relatively deep observations, but it has been you know, detected now in disks. And again, ALM is amazing, and it provides maps. And so not only are we mapping the distribution of gas, uh, but in this really nice work, uh, the temperature structure of the disk was mapped out by taking into account the fact that the optical depth of the 12CO is very high, and then pinpointing where it's located. And from that, you can create empirical temperature maps. And on the whole, uh, what's found is that the Herbigs are truly warmer than the Titaris. Uh, temperatures are typically lower than what you see in thermochemical models. Uh, so that's interesting. It's telling you something about the heating and cooling agents and whether they're there or not. There or not. Um, and uh, while this is very cool, uh, again, non-LTE effects need to, need to be considered in interpreting these. All right, so I kind of rushed through that, so I'll give you some takeaways then. <laughs> um, so uh, we're truly, as I said in the beginning, we're truly in the era of data. We have beautiful high-resolution uh, observations. We have beautiful statistics. And there's you know, tons of work, theoretical work, that's been done to interpret this. Uh, lots of new ways of estimating gas mass, but often the results are strongly, strongly a vary, a vary with the different parameter you use, or different method you use. So we need better calibration across them, or we need new telescopes, essentially. The thermal dust emission, it's telling, well, there's a lot of uncertain parameters uh, behind interpreting the uh, uh, dust emission as a mass. It is quite optically thick, but we do know dust is growing. It is not, no longer interstellar in size. It's at least 100 microns in size. We see a lot of uh, dust lost from class, the very young stages, the, very, the older stages. So something is actually happening to that dust, and we need to make predictions for where it's going to understand its evolution in time. Many of the classical formalisms or assumptions we use need, do need revision, including um, how we convert uh, uh, masses, how we measure radii, uh, but it's not hopeless. We just, you know, there's, there's work to be done. And uh, these observational advances have really enabled, you know, a lot of high detail work mapping the chemistry, the temperature, the structure, the kinematics. Uh, but these are also very expensive, so they're not going to be possible for all disks. You can't rely on this. So we do need to come up with new methods on how to apply these more broadly. So what do we actually do with this information? Well, so, okay, plant information is indeed complicated, but we suggest to, to keep your eye on the big picture. The details matter, but, you know, don't get totally lost in them. Uh, physicists don't ignore the chemists. Uh, chemists don't ignore physicists. Everything is inherently coupled. We can't all work in silos. Uh, if you can survey large numbers of systems, awesome. Uh, but acknowledge and don't ignore limitations of your analysis. Identify some better calibration factors for us that involves method development. And also, if you can model the chemistry and the physics of individual systems in incredible detail, that's great. Um, let's take the next step and to gener generalize those results and make predictions that are testable in a large sample so we can get towards a fundamental picture of planet formation and put our solar system in, finally into context. 
And so I want to just, again, thank the organizers uh, to, for the opportunity to work with these awesome folks. And I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Ilse. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, why don't I start today over here? Um, yes, um, as many of you remember from Protostars and Planets 3, um, this, this issue of dismass has been ongoing. <laughs> and at the time, the discussion led to the following other class of disk estimates. If you take the ages of disks, which are three to 10 million years, and the um, mass accretion rates that we think we see, and you believe in conservation of mass, you get disk estimates. Could you comment on how such estimates with modern data would compare with the disk mass estimates that you presented in your talk? Hi, Fred. Thank you for Hi. that question. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so that's a, a really great uh, point, and I'm hoping that in the, uh, Megan in the next talk might bring this up. Uh, so the the really interesting thing about the the gas masses that are extracted from tracers like CO, if you take the mass at face value and you take the accretion rate onto the star. They shouldn't be here. They, they should be gone. They should have been dispersed. And so that, I think, is one of the, actually one of the key uh, 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 hints that something is going on chemically with CO and that we need clearly some, a, a higher mass, uh, or a not, there needs to be more mass there to explain what we see. Yeah. But in particular, are those mass estimates from the accretion rates large enough to explain what we think we see in planetary systems? No, those are, so those are, the, well, um, that's the Heiss-Mulder's result, where if you believe planet formation is 100% efficient, maybe, but if it can't be, then no. <laughs> no, no, I mean, if you take the accretion rate um, estimates, not the ones you presented, ah, but the other ones, are those yes, large Yes, yes, so then, the, then, then it's okay. As, but then that assumes the accretion rate is constant. Yes, so many assumptions. All right, thank you, Fred. Um, to the back. Thanks. Enrique Macias from East West Germany here. Hi, Elsa. Uh, thanks for the really nice chapter and talk. So I have a comment and a question. So the comment is about the optical depth. So these optical depths that you showed that reach almost one and stay about 0.6, one. Yes. These are optical depths that you get if you assume only absorption opacity. So I just wanted to comment that if you assume and you take into account scattering opacity, which you should, then the optical depths are quite higher. And if exactly. I were getting that in the inner tens of a use, you can reach values of like 10 or so. And exactly. And that so could that, then yeah. explain why you're, you're seeing layers above the meat plane. That could explain why you get grain sizes at 100 microns or so. Yes. And then the question I have is about the evolution of the dust masses. So you, you show that with class one zeros, uh, there seems to be like a factor of five, 10 higher masses than in class twos. And if, if you put all these mass in planetesimals, then you have, again, the same problem where you need a very high planetesimal formation efficiency, right? So do you have any comments on this? I think that's, that's exactly the point. And, and if there are so many planets there, shouldn't we be able to see them or their CPDs? So I, I feel like that's a natural, if that's our explanation. So, so there are many different explanations we can throw out there for why the, uh, the, the observed amount of mass and dust is low, and so different correction factors for that. But they make natural predictions uh, that should have theoretical predictions to back them up that should make observation, observational ah, predictions. So I, I think I don't have a comment on that personally, but I think that's a really excellent point to, to point out, as, as was the first point, too. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go to the back middle. Okay. Uh, Shota Notsu from University of Tokyo. Thank you very much for the very impressive talks. So my question is about the uh, uh, gas to dust mass ratio between the Havik, AD, Havik disks and Tita yes. disks. So it's very interesting. So, is, so my question is that, does it mean that the chemical depletion is more important for TW disk? And uh, if we observe the much uh, the CO, CO9 with longer waves, wavelengths, is it more helpful? Sadly, no. Uh, so even yeah. the optically thin uh, tracers are, are still suggesting the CO, there's an issue with the CO gas. And that's even after factoring in CO freeze out, yep. CO selective photodissociation by the isotopes, there's still a problem. So that's what's sort of underlying the, the, the plot I showed earlier, the Anstel plot. Um, yeah, so there's still an issue. But there is, I think this is a very interesting, I mean, this is the, 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 the difference, the sample of Herbig's is small. I think we need more Herbig disks to actually tell whether this is 
uh, a biased sample of Herbig's and if this mm -hmm. difference is real, but I think it's a, something, an interesting avenue to look at. And I think it's telling us that CO is, is, there's some kind of chemical effect that's probably related to ice. It's not freeze out of CO purely. It has to be going into something bigger, stickier, and harder to you know, remove off greens. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. All right, there are a lot of questions, so if people could keep the questions a little bit shorter, that would be great for the person standing behind you in line. We'll go to the back over here. Yes. Hi, hey, so it's uh, Max. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so we see plants going from hosts going from minus 0.9 dex metallicity to plus 0.6 dex metallicity, but all nearby star forming regions mm -hmm. are um, about solar metallicity. So you have to rely on the theory to scale with metallicity. What are your one, two main different key takeaways or differences in your opinion between metal poor versus metal rich disks in the context of planet formation? That is such a fascinating question. I mean, I feel like I, I am not an expert in, in the, the stellar history, so I don't know how far back you know, the, the metal poor stars go. Like, so you have a time element in that hiding as well. Um, there, there are lots of ideas out there that the giant planets are around the more metal-rich stars, I believe, but then if you go to the smaller planets, that disappears. Um, but I feel like the, the exoplanet folks should really, truly comment yeah. on the statistical well, side. No. But in terms of the theory, yeah. The, yeah, the chemistry. I'm asking about the chemistry. The, the, yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there is an interesting... There does seem, this is sort of newish work, uh, so by Dana Anderson, that finds there is like a sort of break in the chemistry at a certain solid mass. Mm. Uh, so this is, this is recent, or maybe it's not out yet, but it's, <laughs> there's a break where like at uh, 10 Earth masses of solids where like you could form a uh, Jupiter in, in the future or a giant planet in the future versus not, there does seem to be something different going on. So I don't know if that's gonna, that, that would affect everything chemically speaking. It would, if you had different, heating and cooling agents that could affect the modes of planet formation that it can occur. Um, that's a, we should talk more later. I, oh, okay. I have a lot of thoughts now. Okay, Thanks. thank you. That's cool. All right, we'll move over here. Yep. Hello, Peter Wojtke from Graz, Austria. Um, I just would like to make a connection between the chem chemists among us and the hydro people that, you know, what we can measure in the from the molecular temperatures, we have now these beautiful data where you have these surfaces of CO, et cetera, and temperature can really be quite different from, from the midplane temperatures. And I wanted to point out that there are maybe now uh, direct possibilities when you go through the dynamics that you can actually measure temperatures independent of any kind of, of assumption. So, you, you, for example, this pitch angle of, of uh, of spirals that should be directly proportional to or somehow related to the mid-plane temperature. So uh, I just wanted to, I, yeah. I think you, you haven't mentioned these, this could be a future direction that we can uh, have independent uh, measurements of, of temperatures. Absolutely. That was something in, in the chapter we got into is that there's all these different ways of measuring these parameters, including temperature but often they haven't all been done on the same source. I think it's just limited number of people power, but I think we do, we kind of need to find a, at least a couple of gold standard type sources and try these different techniques, try these different methods and calibrate across them because we might get a different answer uh, for the temperature as measured in the mid-plane from one versus the other. So I, I think that's a fabulous, yes, a, a great suggestion, Theater. Thanks. We'll go to the secret microphone over on the left over here. Oh. Hi. Uh Lynn Hillenbrand, Caltech in the US. Um, my whole career, I've just been in a line by myself, I think, so. <laughs> uh, quick question, uh, your H over R or Z over R, yeah. R measurements. One, why are there so few? And two, is that truly density or is that just your tracer? Great question. Uh, the, the observations are incredibly expensive. The maps data, I don't know the total number, but it's something like 120 hours spent on five sources. Now, you could do a more targeted, like C pure CO high resolution, so I think this will kind of come out of maybe XO Alma and some of the other large programs, uh, which would give you now four times more sources. Uh, but it's still, it's hard to do. They're just very expensive observations. So, uh, you know, if we can find a way to infer the vertical structure at lower resolution, uh, I have some ideas about this I can chat about offline. But um, yeah, I think that 
it's an important thing. We, we want to know, are these disks so super flared? And like, what layer of gas are we actually, are we truly tracing the boundary? We know there should be carbon above that. Like, where is, where does it stop? Is it 0 of R of 7, 0.7? Ooh, that's very high. So, yeah. But, and is it true density? Exactly, exactly. So, it's, an, it's a, basically you're seeing the surface. You're seeing that there is molecular gas at least at that layer, and that layer is already pretty high. Um, if you could get really deep data on something with like a, like a, maybe a critical density tracer where you can get like a ground truth, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, there's lots of options. I think we're just people limited again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. We'll go to the front here. Hi, Alwen Rui Xu from Flatiron Institute. So it's great that you mentioned that there has been so many uncertainties in terms of how observation could be translated into even the most basic disk properties like mass and size. So do you think in the future it will be helpful for observations, especially surveys, to quote that these numbers are really apparent mass, apparent disk size, et cetera? For example, you know, brightness temperature is a great diagnostics and we know it's not temperature. At the same time, say the disk mass estimated assuming optical lithium emission 30K is a good diagnostic, but the problem is many of us don't really know that, haven't really internalized that it probably has nothing to do with actual disk mass. I think, yeah, that's like sort of what we're trying to, to get after is to, to motivate, like we need better method and, and model development to, to calibrate these different, yeah, tracers. I think that's exactly what we want. We weren't able to solve this in, in 35 pages, but uh, no, that's exactly what we need in the next Protostars and Planets uh, chapter. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. We'll go to the back. Michelle Bannister, University of Canterbury. So one thing, um, you know, riffing on the dust mass conversion efficiency issue. One difference from the last protostars and planets is we now have a three component ISM. We have dust, we have gas, and we have meter to kilometer scale interstellar object population. How would you see that interstellar objects as um, a factor in this dust mass, uh, you know, th this gaps problem that you have at the moment? I love that. I, so uh, I, I, I don't know enough as an, I'm not an expert in the interstellar object population distribution, it, but I wonder if that's telling us something about the outer radii, total amount of mass at large radii and like whether that material is highly unbound. Um, maybe there are probably other experts in the room on this. So uh, yeah, I think that that would be an interesting thing to look at, that po possible unbound population. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. So we'll move to the middle at the back. Hi. I'm. Uh, I'm Serena Kim from University of Arizona. Uh, there's a question of, a, I have a question about uh, this, right, this plot. Uh, gas to dust mass ratio of actually externally photoevaporating disks. There are, there's a work by Ryan Boyden and ONC uh, class two sources, and they, sh they are typically very small. They're truncated disks with about radius of 20 to 30 AU, and they see when they measured, um, gas mass and then the compared to dust mass, it's more consistent with ISM value than those uh, you've sh yes. shown. Yeah, would, would you uh, explain it? Uh, they explained it as like because CO frees out and because temperature of those disks are hotter than your disks. I think so that's, like, yeah. that's exactly, that's entirely consistent with this picture that these disks could be warmer from the environment they're in. And so then it's sort of slowing down the, the CO conversion process, if that is the explanation. again still work to be done here. You have to find what it's going into. But I like, yeah, that, that is consistent with this plot. Thank you. Excellent. We'll go to the back over here. Yep. Hi, Ilsa. Johanna Teske from Carnegie EPL. Wonderful talk. Thank you. So um, from the exoplanet perspective, I've been interested in starting to worry more about um, how we take small numbers of uh, objects where we have a lot of data and understand how what we infer relates to the larger population. And so I think the problem is maybe even bigger do, doing that conversion um, with protoplanetary disks, but I was wondering if, if your community or people um, yeah, working on this have been thinking about that kind of small sample to broader population question. I mean, we're, we're definitely definitely thinking about it. And I think that, you know, we're finding, like when you find uh, a really good match, for example, from a model to, a, to data, you know, that there, there are many paths to, make, to getting data and a model to match. And I think that, you know, really getting after some gold standard sources, getting as much data as you can and creating as the, the best model you possibly can of that source and then trying to like, push it into like weird environments exactly, you know, and, and make some predictions. That's the, the only way to go. Um, so we, we kind of have to do both of these paths in parallel where we spend a ton of time on specific sources 
and surveys, but yeah, it's, it's, I th it's, it's gonna be a massively community-wide endeavor for all of us, yeah. Sorry, it's not a great answer, but I think it's just what we have to do. All right, we have time for one or two more questions. We'll start over here. Okay, Tristan Guillaume from uh, Nice, France. I'd like to uh, come back to this very nice uh, plot that you showed with the dust mass uh, as a function of time, showing that dust, is, uh, uh, dust mass is decreasing globally. And yeah, that one. And uh, relate that to a poster by my young colleague, uh, Masanobu Kunitomo, showing that if we have uh, uh, accretion of gas that is uh, low metallicity uh, towards the end of the evolution of the sun, uh, it explains better the uh, composition and neutrino flux of the sun. And this relates yes. to the existence of a pebble wave early that was shown uh, already from Pascal Garraud's work, for example, in uh, 2007. But here we just see the dust, we, we don't have the gas. So would you agree that the gas is living on uh, with a longer time scale. We, that's what we absolutely need to measure, the gas. But I, I, I saw that that poster is fascinating. And I think that if we could find a way to also, can, can we detect ever the dust, like dusty flows from the disk to the star? It's, I mean, stellar abundances is already hard enough, but for the young stars, it's possible, except uh, there's beautiful work by Mikhail Kama doing this for the more massive stars. But yeah, I think there's that this is exactly what we, the work that needs to be done. We'll take one last question. Thanks. Uh, Guillaume Leb, ENS de Lyon, thanks a lot. Uh, in this view, the disks are necessarily circular. But uh, we know from uh, 20 years of beautiful physics, from Ogilvy's and uh, uh, Barker, Lynch, and so that there is much to be learned from eccentricities, uh, from because it's sensible to dissipation. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. in the eccentric disk, you have vari variable edge, it excites the bulk physics. And if you interpret the line velocities with uh, assuming secular disk, you might you might get a lot of uh, artifacts. So, are there some perspectives, programs to measure those eccentricities in the disk? So. Could you comment on this? Uh, on this, uh, I mean, depending on what, what wavelength you're talking about, like so. So, I mean, D sharp, D -sharp with Alma found lots of like azimuthal substructure or azimuthal, azimuthally symmetric mostly disks were pretty shockingly common, which is entirely different from what's seen, you know, in the scattered light. So, I think that you know, there's something going on vertically there at the different layers of the disk. Um, in terms of you know the, the chapter we found the two dimensions already pretty hard so we didn't we did not go out into the third uh, but uh, yeah I think that this kind of gets back to Joanna's point like if we can get to if we can get to a good understanding of the simple cases can we push the models and make predictions to get into the like, highly eccentric disk cases yeah there is a poster from Enrico Ragusa cool Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been told by the organizers to uh, warn everybody that there's going to be a photo taken at the end of this session. So uh, please don't disappear immediately following the next talk. But I'd like to thank Ilse again, and I'd uh, like to hope that next time we won't just have the physicists and chemists talking to one another. We'll have the biologists too, so we'll get to your aliens. But uh, thank you very, very much. <laughs>